It's a pleasure for me to present this topic, shoulder MR and instability. My name is Bill Palmer, and I'm a skeletal radiologist from Mass General Hospital in Boston. During the next 25 minutes or so, I'll be looking at glenohumeral instability, including the labrum, the joint capsule, and the glenoid rim. In patients with glenohumeral instability, the most important structure is the labral ligamentous complex. I'll be addressing abnormalities of the labral ligamentous com complex in the context of acute dislocation, and I'll be focusing on anterior dislocation, not so much posterior or multi-directional instability. And then I'll be looking at chronic instability with abnormalities that involve both bone as well as the soft tissues. The primary passive stabilizer of the joint is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. The labrum attaches the ligament to the underlying bone. Therefore, when the labrum is torn away from the bone and the underlying cartilage, then the inferior glenohumeral ligament is attached to a structure that um, is no longer attached to the bone and therefore it loses function and becomes incompetent. This diagram shows the posterior and anterior aspects of the glenoid fossa, the labrum, the biceps tendon, and the three glenohumeral ligaments, superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligament. It is this inferior IGL that is the primary passive stabilizer of the shoulder. This depicts the humeral head and the glenoid, the cartilage, and then the IGL that's coming to attach partially to the labrum and then partially to the adjacent bone and periosteum. And we'll see later in this talk how when the labrum tears off the underlying cartilage and bone, it can strip along the medial glenoid neck and form characteristic lesions such as the Alpsa lesion. Let's look at normal anatomy. This is an axial slice, and I'll be going through these sequentially. At the top of the shoulder, here is the coracoid process and the humeral head, and this is some of the biceps tendon, and you can see it coursing down into the bicipital tendon groove. Superior labrum is here, and superior glenohumeral ligament. The SGL merges with a rotator interval, and as we course more inferiorly than the MGL, middle glenohumeral ligament can be followed to the point where it merges with the subscapularis tendon. In the anterosuperior location, the labrum shows developmental variations that can include sulci or a foramen. So in this particular case, the labrum I think is completely undercut by contrast material. This is an orthographic study and all this white stuff represents contrast that's been injected into the joint. And in this location, uh, this is not representative of a labral tear. Instead, this is a normal development, uh, developmental variation, a sublabral sulcus or foramen. Now notice here posteriorly, the labrum is normally situated over the glenoid rim, and then it is partially undercut by articular cartilage, and that is uh, also normal. So as we follow the, um, the labrum more inferiorly, here is some cartilage, here is the normal labral contour, and then finally here is the IGL, inferior glenohumeral ligament. We follow it back up to its attachment site to the base of the labrum, and then you can see how it's also partially attaching to the adjacent bone. So the labrum can tear here, and this whole labral ligamentous complex can strip medially along the glenoid neck. This is the uh, ABER image. ABER stands for abduction external rotation. And this position is achieved by the technologists at the time of MR imaging by placing the patient's hand behind their head. So this is the glenoid, this is the humerus, this is the greater tuberosity and the bottom or articular surface of the rotator cuff. And here antero-inferiorly is the labrum, the articular cartilage of the glenoid, and this is the IGL. And so you can follow the inferior glenohumeral ligament from its humeral attachment site here all the way back to the labral attachment site. So you can imagine that at the time of dislocation, the humeral head is sliding out of the socket. It's placing tension 
on the IgL, which is transmitted back to the labral attach to the labrum, which then can tear or detach from the underlying bone. That is an important mechanism for labral ligamentous injury and the setting of trauma. Here is a non-orthographic axial image. This is proton density. And in the absence of distension of the joint by intraarticular contrast material, it can be more difficult identifying the contour of the labrum and very difficult identifying the IGL and its attachment site to labrum. So more caudally in this case, here's the axillary pouch and a presumption can be made that this uh, low signal structure represents the capsule and in this location it should be the IGL. So we can follow that. This should be IGL here back up towards the labrum. So when there is a tear of the labrum antero inferiorly, in the absence of contrast inside the joint, certain presumptions can be made. And uh, if a tear is in a characteristic location, it can be presumed that it's at the location or attachment site of the ligament and therefore is a lesion that may be associated with glenohumeral instability. The coronal images are valuable um, for demonstration of the superior labrum here. So you can see the articular cartilage of the humeral head, the superior labrum, the cartilage of the superior glenoid, and follow that articular cartilage down inferiorly and then here is the inferior labrum. So the labrum always should be situated when it's normal over the glenoid rim, as in this particular case. So how do we diagnose labral tear? Well, an important criterion is the presence of sublabral fluid. So fluid that is either inside the labrum or commonly at the junction of labrum and the underlying articular cartilage. Associated findings, in the presence of labral tear include contour irregularity, a signal increase inside the labrum, which can reflect degeneration or the tear itself, and I think most importantly, the presence of fragment displacement from the glenoid rim. So the further the fragment is displaced from the glenoid rim, the more likely that it is a torn labral fragment. It's important to look for adjacent articular cartilage defects, so chondral lesions, flaps, focal defects, are all associated with adjacent labral tears and can increase diagnostic confidence when present. Likewise, a paralabral cyst, which is a small fluid collection that I'll show subsequently, is pathognomonic for an adjacent labral tear. Let's look at some examples of labral tears. So here's an 18-year-old who has known glenohumeral instability. And these are axial grainy and echo images, and we're starting at the apex of the joint and looking here at the humeral head and can follow the biceps tendon down into the bicipital tendon groove. On the gradient echo image, articular cartilage is high in signal intensity. Now this is a normal posterior labrum. It just so happens there is a retroverted glenoid with a developmental variation resulting in a hypertrophy or thickening of the labrum and a more extensive undercutting by cartilage. But Except for that developmental variation, this is a normal configuration of labrum, cartilage, and subchondral bone. Okay, let's uh, return to the anterior labrum. So we're superior here, and now anterosuperior, and this could represent a developmental variation in this location. In other words, a sublabral foramen. And as we go more caudally, here now we are anteroinferior in location, close to where the MGL is merging with the tendon of subscapularis. And in this location, notice the irregular contour and these abnormal linear regions of high signal within the labrum that can be followed caudally. So in this location, we do not expect to see either a sulcus or foramen. And this is the level at which we expect to see the IGL, which is probably here, attaching to the labrum. Therefore, the IGL is attached to the labrum that is torn and displaced mildly from its underlying labral fragment, and therefore this, um, this ligament uh, may be incompetent, and these findings may be associated with glenohumeral instability. So we don't uh, frequently obtain an Aber image in a non-arthrographic study of the shoulder, but in this case we did. This thickening here represents the joint capsule there's some high signal, and as we go more caudally, notice how this uh, fluid is uh, present within the labrum. This is one labral fragment, 
Here's the other labral fragment that's attached to uh, the adjacent cartilage. So the IGL is attached to a labrum that's torn and therefore is incompetent, and that is what's associated with the instability in this particular case. Here's another example of a labral tear. This is an orthographic study. MGL, subscapularis, biceps tendon, anterior labrum. It looks normal on this, on this particular slice. And then a little bit of undercutting, more undercutting where no normal sulcus should exist. Undercutting here as well. And then um, on the Aber images, here's the lesser tuberosity, the biceps tendon in the groove, the greater tuberosity, the articular surface of the rotator cuff. And as we continue down, here is the anterior labrum, and we're starting to see the IGL. As I go down one more slice, here is the IGL, IGL attaching to the labrum. Here is contrast in the tear. And then here is the tear, and here is a paralabral cyst. So fluid in this uh, case has passed through a tear and into this very small extra capsular location, extra articular location, and that represents the cyst, a finding that is pathognomonic for an adjacent labral tear. These are the coronal images in the same case, and from posterior to anterior, we can see the inferior labrum. This is the tear, this is the capsular tissue, this is the fluid, and then here is the paralabral cyst. Okay, and then the labral tear here, antero-inferiorly. In a different case, here's a normal appearing anterior labrum, posterior labrum, MGL, subscapularis tendon, MGL merging in with subscapularis. And then here is some high signal that's undercutting a piece of articular cartilage. So notice that there is contrast in the joint and that this contrast is leaking under the cartilage adjacent to the antero-inferior labrum. And then here's the tear of the articular cartilage. So this is a cartilage flap or a location where delamination has occurred. And notice that there is this low signal structure that is projecting down into the axillary pouch. And we can follow it back up to the inferior labrum. And this could represent a labral fragment, most likely, but also pieces of articular cartilage from up in this location, for example, can also be detached partially and then displaced into different locations, most commonly the axillary pouch. Okay, so we have an antero-inferior labral tear, chondral flap, and a partially detached labral fragment displaced into the axillary pouch. And here on the Aber images, lesser tuberosity, biceps tendon, greater tuberosity, rotator cuff tendon, normal articular surface, very smooth. And then here, we're starting to see the IGL. Notice the high signal in this area, and that uh, reflects the chondral lesion. And then here is the contrast that's leaking under the labrum at the chondral junction, labral chondral junction here. This is the tear. And here on the coronal images, uh, T1 weighted with fat suppression, T2 weighted here and we'll follow these images posteriorly. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Here is the labrum, here's the contrast in the tear, here's the chondral flap. There's even some subchondral bone marrow edema associated with this chondral flap. And then here, um, you can see this uh, partially detached displaced labral fragment. Notice that this is low in signal intensity, but more distally, we have a trilaminar appearance. So low signal, high signal, low signal again. And so therefore this is a labral fragment and then a piece of articular cartilage as well. And so together then they become displaced into the axillary pouch. And of course that can cause mechanical symptoms and uh, just like a displaced meniscal fragment in the knee uh, needs to be removed. So let me turn now um, to uh, the second of three topics acute dislocation and uh, the expected imaging findings. So Dr. Hill and Dr. Sachs in 1940 published the groove defect of the humeral head, what we now call the Hill-Sachs fracture or impaction fracture or defect or deformity. This is how it happens. The patient in this case has been scanned at the time of dislocation. And what it illustrates is the, in this sagittal or oblique sagittal plane is scapula, clavicle, coracoid process, glenoid, humeral head. 
Because it's an impaction injury, this fat-suppressed T2-weighted sequence shows impaction-related bone marrow edema involving the glenoid as well as the adjacent humeral head. Next slice, we're starting to see the defect, and this defect is created by the glenoid rim. The glenoid rim can fracture or it can impact into the humeral head, causing this large defect. So this defect is so large that it's engaging the glenoid rim and it is not reducible. And so this patient uh, will have to be reduced uh, under general anesthesia. But here you can see the large hatchet-shaped uh, defect in the humeral head, the so-called Hillsax defect. Okay. And here it is, and here it is again. And then here in the coronal plane, the, in this case, very large Hillsax defect, and then the glenoid rim that's uh, causing this fracture. Let's look at uh, some cases in the setting of acute dislocation. Here's a construction worker, he's 38 years old. Uh, he was on a ladder, slipped and fell about 20 feet and hurt both of his shoulders. And when transport arrived, uh, he was taken to the hospital where the radiographs were negative. He went on to MR. And I have here side by side a gradient echo axial image and then a fat suppressed T2 weighted image. And let's just follow these images down. Okay, so we're already seeing something right here. And this is not normal. And on this fat suppressed sequence, this represents edema, bone marrow contusion. It's at the superolateral aspect of the humeral head and therefore it represents a hill sax fracture. This is a mild degree of impaction with adjacent bone marrow contusion. So this contusion, of course, is only going to be seen in the acute or subacute setting. Down the road, after the healing process has taken place, then all of this will dissipate. So you'll expect to see the impaction phenomenon of bone marrow edema in the acute or subacute setting. So we're going to follow these images down, and now we see a very, very abnormal anterior labral ligamentous complex. And one of the most important things to look for in the setting of a dislocation is an abnormality involving the glenoid rim, because if there is a fracture antero-inferiorly, the prognosis is greatly decreased. And you would expect this person to go on to chronic glenohumeral instability, and a soft tissue repair at arthroscopy is likely to be insufficient. And it'll be necessary instead to reattach the bone to bone, either using a screw or if the fragment is too small for that, to perform a procedure such as the ladder J procedure, where there is a bony block that's placed at the antero inferior glenoid rim to help re-stabilize the joint. But here on the gradient echo and the T2 weighted images, this is in the acute setting, this is not an orthographic study, this is a joint effusion. You can see this deficiency of the glenoid rim antero inferiorly, which represents the fracture. Here is the fracture plane, and then it extends down inferiorly. And notice that the IGL here, this is subscapularis attaching to the humerus. This is the IGL attaching to the humerus, and we follow it backwards to its attachment site to the labral ligamentous complex, and then this larger fracture fragment. Here in the coronal plane is the labral capsular injury, and then here is the fracture plane, and here is the IGL that's attached normally to the labrum, but unfortunately, the labrum is attached to a piece of bone that's fractured away from the glenoid itself. Okay. And then notice there is this associated chondral flap. So this is fluid that's getting under this little piece of articular cartilage. And then here is the fracture again at the IGL attachment site. And the sagittal images are going to be excellent for demonstrating the size of the fracture fragment. This is a T1 weighted image. This is a T2 weighted image. And then here is the fracture line. So this would be considered uh, a large fracture fragment, but it's non-displaced. Here's the same individual, but now we're going to look at the right shoulder. So this guy was very, very unlucky. So now, um, as we come more inferiorly, here's the MGL. And then here's a deficiency of the glenoid rim. And then notice this is the fracture fragment. So some of this is labrum, some of this is bone, and this puzzle piece fits right here. And so the glenoid rim fracture fragment is displaced a substantial distance from its donor site. And then here it is on the gradient echo image. 
And so this um, shoulder most certainly uh, will go on to chronic instability unless a repair is performed. Okay, so here's the large fracture fragment. Here's the IGL that's followed back to its attachment to that fracture fragment, uh, which is displaced wildly from its donor site. And then here in the coronal plane, here's the fracture fragment, here's the IGL, and then this is the degree of diastasis or separation between the, um, the bone at the donor site and the fracture fragment. So let's look at some other examples in the setting of acute dislocation. So American football player, 17 years old, got tackled, uh, no deformity, no obvious dislocation, had to leave the game. His MR is two weeks following the injury. These are oblique sagittal images, T1 weighted, fat suppressed T2 weighted. This is an orthographic study and it shows a very minimally depressed hill sacs fracture. But what is much more obvious, I think, is this large bone marrow contusion with marrow edema involving the humeral head. And when you see this, then uh, you can uh, make a certain conclusion very confidently. And the conclusion is that this person has had an anterior or anteroinferior, a, a subcoracoid glenohumeral dislocation. That's the only way this impaction injury can occur. And again, you're only gonna see this in the acute or subacute setting. <clears throat> These are the coronal images. And uh, let's see now, the rotator cuff tendon is normal as I go more posteriorly. We're starting to run into the region of bone marrow contusion. Very, very subtle findings antero-inferiorly. Let's look at the axial images. Subscapularis tendon, here's biceps in the groove, that's normal. And we have a normal uh, anterior and posterior labrum at this level, mid-glenoid level. And now we're going to take it slice by slice inferiorly. We're starting to see something here. At that point, it's equivocal, but not anymore. We're seeing contrast material here now undercutting the labrum at the, uh, this is a part of the IGL here and here at the IGL attachment site. Okay, so non-displaced antero-inferior labral tear at the IGL attachment site, so-called bank card lesion. 17-year-old wrestler. So here's a non-orthographic study. There's a hill sacs fracture with a uh, bone marrow edema and uh, so this is the anterior labrum. It's displaced from the glenoid rim. We're gonna follow this labrum down inferiorly where it continues to show this linear high signal, this fluid undercutting the labrum in the location where there should be no normal foramen. Therefore, this represents a labral tear. And this is a part of the um, ligamentous complex, uh, a developmental variation, a combination of MGL and more distally IGL. But again, the most important point is that the IGL is followed back to this labrum, which is uh, torn away from the glenoid rim. 23 year old, this is a, a pitcher, he tripped and fell. Pitchers aren't as coordinated as position players. And uh, he gets up, but has shoulder pain, has this MRI. So now we have these coronal images and they are T2 weighted and fat suppressed. This is the cuff tendon that's coming down to the greater tuberosity. We can see the superior labrum here. He's a pitcher, so he has a, a small labral tear. Here's the problem. This is what's related to the fall. Notice this acute edema and hemorrhage, and this is the IGL. Here's the labrum, and they are separated. And I'll come back to this anterior slice that shows the anterior inferior labrum. This is the tear, the edema and hemorrhage related to the capsular stripping along the glenoid neck. And then more posteriorly, the, the, in, the uh, labral capsular complex looks normal. And here's a little bit of the edema from the hill sacs fracture. Axial images, just minimal impaction injury. The MGL, the labral tear, normal posterior labrum, and we can follow it caudally. Okay. Another picture, um, he literally threw his arm out of the socket, um, a 98 mile per hour fastball. And you can tell here that he's had, uh, this is not a new labral tear uh, because of the increased signal intensity. This is not an orthographic study, it's a gradient echo sequence. And there's this large effusion or hemarthrosis from the injury. So here's the labrum. It's displaced from the glenoid rim. Here's an adjacent chondral defect. And uh, more distally, um, the uh, displacement of the of the labrum medially from its expected location. Here's the labrum, it should be here, but it's 
pulled back more posteriorly. Here's the location of the chondral defect. And then more caudally, here's another displaced labral fragment in the axillary pouch. Okay, very similar to what we saw in the previous case, which also had a chondral defect and this um, antero-inferior labral tear. Coronal images, same patient. And we're starting to see the glenoid rim here. Here is um, the region where the articular cartilage is missing. Here the cartilage is followed down in the glenoid fossa. Here it is gone. Uh, this is where the labrum should be located. Uh, it's very uh, deficient and small in size. And then here is the displaced labral fragment. And notice at the end of this uh, small sliver of labrum, there's another trilaminate appearance. So this area right here of absent articular cartilage um, has, is, reflects the fact that the cartilage fragment has now been displaced into the axillary pouch. So labrum and then articular cartilage with its trilaminate appearance. Same person, here is the focal cartilage defect, the piece of cartilage now displaced into the axillary pouch. Recent dislocation, and this shows a variation on a theme. So we have a proton density coronal and a fat suppressed T2 weighted image, and all this edema and hemorrhage in the region of the posterior uh, circumflex neurovascular bundle. And so here's the labrum, that looks normal. Here is the IGL, and it shows a normal attachment to the labrum. But as we follow this IGL around, this is the axillary pouch here, not here. As we follow this IGO around to this point, we, we notice that it is separated from the bone. So this is fluid that's in the joint and it is continuous with fluid that is outside of the joint. And so that means that there has been a detachment of the capsule, the IGL, from its humeral attachment site, the so-called Hegel lesion, humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. And as I come a slice more anterior, you can see this continuity of fluid the separation of the ligament from the expected attachment site to the bone, and then here all this fluid that's spilling out side of the joint. Well, okay, let's go on to the last of the three major topics, and that is chronic instability. So now we're going to look at the MR imaging findings in patients with uh, chronic instability. So here's uh, Derek Jeter sliding into home, and um, he... Uh, has this knee that's been pushed into his left shoulder and he's not doing very well and he's taken off the field. So he was diagnosed with left glenohumeral dislocation. And so does that mean the end of his career? This is April 2003. Well, here's July 2011 and Jeter's back on the field. He's um, actually hitting a home run here uh, for his 3,000th hit. So no. Dislocation does not always mean uh, the end of an athletic life. And however, depending on your age, it can mean something very serious. In other words, a predisposition for repeat dislocation and then therefore the development of chronic instability. Let's briefly look at this article that was published in JBJS in 2006 entitled Functional Outcome and risk of recurrent instability after primary traumatic anterior shoulder dislocation in young patients. It was prospective. It enrolled 252 patients, 15 to 35 years in age. All patients were treated the same way initially with a slang and PT. Depending on how they did with the conservative treatment, they went on to um, surgical treatment if their instability persisted. So this is the results of the study, and um, the major findings are that within two years after the first dislocation, they were likely to have a second dislocation if they were young, 15, 20 years old, and male. And so nearly 100% likelihood of repeat dislocation if you are a male and 15 years old, um, because males who are 15 years old don't stop doing what they were doing in the first place. And so they're more predisposed to repeat dislocation. In contrast to the 35-year-old um, who is more likely to change their behavior and modify their activity and, uh, and therefore not 
have a recurrent dislocation. So the take home point is um, the critical factors for repeat dislocation are age and gender. And you're most likely to have a repeat dislocation within the first two years after your second dislocation. Let me illustrate that by uh, looking at the 17 year old female a lacrosse player who was hoping to obtain a scholarship uh, for college. So there was a collision, she was hurt, she has glenohumeral um, apprehension, no obvious laxity. These are the radiographs and they show a normal glenohumeral alignment, no fracture, uh, they are normal. Here are the MR images and I show these sagittal images to emphasize the importance of the sagittal plane for assessing the anterior and antero-inferior glenoid contour uh, for the presence of deficiency and fracture. And in her particular case, the contour is normal. These are the gradient echo axial images. Here's the biceps tendon and the normal MGL, the normal uh, sublabral foramen antero superiorly, and then now uh, the antero-inferior labrum. Here it looks normal. Now, look at this very, very subtle increase in signal intensity at the labral chondral junction. And so this is a non-displaced Bankart lesion. And I just want to point out how subtle it is. And so there's this very minimal high signal and then in here through, through here as well. So in the setting of suspected glenohumeral instability, you need to look very, very, in a very targeted and directed way at this antero-inferior labrum to identify these subtle labral tears. Here in the coronal plane, there's a normal inferior labrum. So this is an antero-inferior labral tear at the IGL attachment site. So this person goes on to arthroscopy. Um, and before I show the arthroscopic video, let me just review the imaging findings. Here on these gradient echo images is the tear. And so there is an antero-inferior labral tear, a normal humeral contour without hill sacs fracture, and a normal glenoid contour as well without a rim fracture. So a soft tissue injury, nothing bony. So the decision was made by the surgeon and the patient together to proceed with a soft tissue repair, so-called Bankart repair. So let's look at that next. So we're inside your shoulder now. So here's, here's the, the humeral uh, head. Here's, here's the, the glenoid. I'm right about a midpoint. Rim. This and is the labrum. You can see there's a bit of an injury the here. My probe, probe is going underneath Placed it. into um, the antero-inferior labrum. The okay, so let me stop it there for a moment. So now I'm looking down on the front let of me go your back for There's a, a bit of an injury here. My okay, so this is the antero-inferior labrum. The capsule is attached to that, and the probe is being inserted into this labrum, which is easily displaced from the glenoid rim. And so what's going to need to be done is a reattachment of this uh, incompetent labral tissue back to the glenoid rim. Probe is going underneath it. Um, is, so is we're gonna look, um, this is a posterior portal. Now, now this I'm is down uh, on the looking from above. And so this is an anterior superior portal. And the uh, superior glenoid is here. The inferior glenoid is down here. This is the posterior glenoid rim and the posterior labrum in a normal sulcus between the posterior labrum and its uh, chondro-osseous attachment site. So now we'll focus on the antero-inferior region. Front of your shoulder. So the back this is, is here, the location the of the labral there. tear. So the now is here. This is the, the probe is being My probe put again is into that labral tear. front edge of the hammock this is there. This is injected so um, hemorrhagic tissue way. due to the, the tear. So you can notice if I just go back for a moment, uh, this fraying, which represents uh, primarily localized synovitis and fraying of the labrum. So, I've done the so now the repair now. has been done. And so if I'll just stop the video to show the humeral head, this is the glenoid fo fossa, this is the anterior labrum, and this is some suture material. So all this in here represents the, the labral back. ligamentous if tissue pull out here, that has you can been see the reattached the to the glenoid the rim. I give That's a push, small I chondral defect in this location. So what the surgeon just did was just bump did. Um, the I humerus the to show that it is no longer subluxating over the glenoid rim. Back. It's sort of the edge of the hammer. Okay, so he's very proud back. of his uh, result. There's a the ball in the back. So these are the suture sitting. materials. This push. is the reattached it, it tissue here. It won't go out anymore. And he's bumping That's the humerus. Scar. These little that sutures are going to sort of get stuck in the scar and pull out of the way. You won't see them anymore. So the 17-year-old does very well. No apprehension, four months following the surgery. And so she signs uh, to go to college and joins the lacrosse team. Now, 13 months post-op, she's playing lacrosse and there's a subluxation event. 
diving for the ball. So she tries to return to play, doesn't work out very well, persistent pain apprehension, and these are her radiographs now, showing the two anchor sites, but that's all. And then here's the MR in the sagittal plane, showing one anchor site, another anchor site, this is an orthographic study, the glenoid rim is still normal in contour. And here are those two anchor sites in the attached soft tissue. This is now the axial plane and the MGL followed down to subscapularis tendon. And we follow this anterior labrum down to one anchor site. And it's very difficult to see, but it's right in here. And although tissue can be followed to the anchor site, there's also a defect where there should be no defect post-op. And as we um, extend more caudal, this is the other anchor site. There's a focal defect here. That black dot represents some suture material. And then we have the IGL coming back and attached to the labrum that's displaced from where it should be attached to an anchor. So this is a recurrent antero-inferior labral tear at the IGL attachment site. And that explains her recurrent instability. So a 17-year-old who went back to playing lacrosse after her first dislocation, just as we discussed from that article, she's at a high risk for recurrent instability, and that's what's happened. <clears throat> These are the coronal images, show some of the suture material here, those two little black dots. And then here is the region of the recurrent tear. This is one of the anchor sites. And then this is the labrum here that should be up there. And so now the inferior labrum is also involved, not just the antero-inferior labrum, and it's displaced from its normal location. And let me make a comparison between the pre-op study and now here this post-op with recurrent instability. So this is a deficient inferior labrum, and this is the normal labrum pre-op situated over the glenoid rim. And then here it's been displaced and slightly medialized. So the findings then, two anchor sites, partially torn inferior labral ligamentous complex, normal glenoid contour. So this person has failed soft tissue repair. And um, the uh, standard of care in that case is now to proceed with a ladder J procedure where the coracoid process is taken and attached to the antero-inferior portion of the glenoid rim. And that is uh, taken along with um, the uh, short head of biceps and coracobrachialis muscle to form a sling to help support the humeral head in the socket. So now this is um, immediately post-op, you can notice the gas and you can see that there's no coracoid process anymore. It's been cut right here and attached to the antero-inferior glenoid by these two screws. So it's not just a bony bolster, it's also the presence of the attached muscle tendon unit, short head biceps and coracobrachialis that help to uh, provide stability to the glenohumeral joint. So here is that, here is the, uh, the plane of osteotomy at the base of the coracoid process, and then here is the coracoid process attached by these two screws. So six months later now, the patient comes for a CT. So why is the CT done? Well, before this person is going to be allowed to go back to contact sport, lacrosse, it's necessary to demonstrate that there is some bony bridging. So we follow the screws to the region of the fracture fragment, and because of the artifact, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but there is some continuity of bone right here. Okay, so it looks like it's healing. And then here is the bone graft. There is continuity here. The bone graft is perfectly situated and um, smooth with the contour of the glenoid rim. And then here is the bony continuity. And then here is bony continuity here as well. Okay, so she goes back to laying, playing lacrosse, um, becomes an all-conference um, winner, and uh, the story ends well. So let me now turn to some variations on the theme in patients with chronic instability. And there are some surgeons and radiologists who use these terms, Bankard, Perthes lesion, ALPSA, anterior labral ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion, GLAD, glenolabral articular disruption, and then Hegel, as we've seen already, humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. 
And although、um, you can go ahead and use those terms yourself,、uh, make sure that your audience understands what they mean. And if they might not, then it's better to use generic descriptions of abnormalities that involve the inferior labral ligamentous complex. In addition to the adjacent lesions like abnormalities of the glenoid rim, the periosteum, and the articular cartilage. So here's a 37-year-old, one of those extreme athletes, and、uh, he has normal strength at physical examination, and is said to have、uh, no apprehension.、Uh, so this looks like it might be a Hill-Sachs defect.、Um, sometimes overhead athletes develop cystic changes that look like Hill-Sachs fractures. But as we continue more caudally, we can see a couple of things. Anteroinferiorly, there's some high signal undercutting the labrum. There's a cyst、uh, posteroinferiorly and a posteroinferior labral tear. And then this labral tear、um, extends down inferiorly as well. Here in the Aber images, the IGL. Here's the labrum. Here's the tear. Here's the small paralabral cyst. Okay, so notice that the labrum is displaced in the Aber position. Whereas it was not displaced in the、um, adducted position. Okay, so that is because of the tension that's tr- transmitted through the IGL to the labrum. So that's why the Aber images、uh, are performed oftentimes to increase the sensitivity for detection of non-displaced labral tears. So this person decided not to have surgery,、um, and, and he returns 20 months later now with apprehension and、uh, gross instability. Let's compare. Um, the、uh, time points. Here is the baseline image, and then here is 20 months later. And you can see that this labrum now is displaced from the glenoid rim. And here is the labrum. It was in a normal location 20 months earlier. And then here is、uh, the non-displaced labral tear that is now、uh, very much a displaced labral tear. Now the posterior inferior cyst is unchanged, as is the posterior inferior labral tear. But what has changed is this、uh, Bankart lesion with substantial displacement of the labral fragment from the glenoid rim, and there's probably now a chondral defect adjacent to that region.、Uh, here on the Aber images is this、uh, labral ligamentous complex displaced from its donor site. Here is a part of the chondral defect, and then this is a comparison of the anteroinferior labrum on an Aber image. Uh, 20 months down the road, and then here back to baseline, where it was minimally displaced, and now it's substantially displaced. So you could think about this essentially as the natural history of、um, of glenohumeral instability. Here in the coronal plane、um, is the fluid in the paralabral cyst, and then here is the chondral defect with contrast material undercutting the chondral flap. And another patient, 27-year-old, multi-sport athlete. Here is the labral tear, some paralabral cyst. The labral tear、um, is associated with a chondral flap, and then that labral tear extends into the inferior labrum、uh, as well. And then here, posteriorly, is continuity, is continuation of the labral tear. And on the axial images, we can see that there is this anterior labral tear, minimal displacement of the labrum from its expected location. Posteriorly, it's the same kind of phenomenon that is occurring, where contrast is undercutting the labrum, and then the capsule here is partially、uh, stripped medially, and then here is a focal chondral defect. So now we have an anterior labral tear in combination with a posterior labral tear, and these are the findings that may be associated with multi-directional instability, not just anterior but also posterior. This labral tear extends all the way inferiorly. At the IGL attachment site, and then we have on the Aber images the anterior tear, and notice that you can follow the IGL down to the labrum, displaced mildly, medial stripping of the capsule and periosteum, and if you had to put a name to this, you could call this a Perthes lesion because of the minimal displacement. Okay,、um, nearing the end. Uh, this is an individual who's had some rugby injuries. He thinks he's had at least two dislocations, and、uh, based on physical exam, clearly has an unstable shoulder. So right off, we see that there's an impacted Hillsax fracture. And here is the anterior labrum. Here is the MGL. Here is the labrum that we can follow distally down to the glenoid. 
And so it is medialized. So here is the um, the IGL coming up, and it is attached to a labrum that's scarred down and displaced from its expected location. So this is the so-called Alps lesion. And in the Aber position, here is the labral tear, and then here is the IGL, and it's followed down to this labral attachment site. The labrum should be here; it's displaced medially. This is capsular and periosteal stripping. So a medialized labral ligamentous complex, classic Alps lesion. And with that, I conclude. And during the time that I've had, I've addressed the labrum and the labral ligamentous complex, uh, the appearance of the labral tear antero inferiorly. And what I recommend in your reports is that you identify um, in the report the location of the tear and describe, uh, when possible, its length. In other words, antero inferior. Um, with inferior extension. I've also gone over the appearance of uh, bony lesions and labral tears in the setting of acute dislocation and contrasted those findings with their appearances in chronic instability. And I've also tried to review some of the surgical procedures, such as the soft tissue repair versus the Latterjay procedure. And with that, I conclude, and thank you for your attention.